Thank you for joining our report launch and webinar today on showing the light, supporting young parents with experience of the care system. You should see in the GoToWebinar system a little box which provides you information about how you can ask questions and how you can uh, manage your system while we are in this webinar. If you do have questions or concerns, please uh, type them into those chat functions and they will be available to the ERACI staff. I will now hand over to our lead for research here at ERACI who will take us through our webinar. Please welcome Barbara Barker. Thanks, Ros. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Barbara Barker. I'm lead researcher with ERACI and your presenter for this afternoon's webinar. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in today's webinar. We're very excited that today's webinar is the launch of our new report showing the light, supporting young parents with experience of the care system. I'll be giving an overview of the report, highlighting its key findings and the research, research approach behind the report. We'll then have a panel discussion with our guests. I'm really excited to be welcoming along today Shelley Kevers, a Create Foundation Youth Ambassador and Young Parent Advocate. Professor Philip Mendez, Director of the Social Inclusion and Social Policy Research Unit in the Department of Social Work at Monash down in Melbourne. Jessica Cox, Manager, Service Design and Innovation, Children and Families at Life Without Barriers. And Dr. Joseph McDowell, Executive Director of Research at Create Foundation. We're thrilled to have all of them on board and we'll talk to them a bit later. We look forward to that discussion and, and I also encourage you to send through your questions as, as I present the findings today. I'm just going to present some of those findings now. I hope you can see my screen there. Okay, and I will turn off my camera. Good, yeah. Fabulous. I have to admit that when Aracy first started doing this piece of work, I was a little bit surprised, uh, a little bit nervous and concerned, I'll admit. And the reason for that is that it's not an area that we've often delved into. There are a lot of experts in this area doing good work in the space, um, those who are providing services uh, among you know, organisations uh, with practitioners that are supporting these young people. And we know that there are good researchers and excellent experts as well doing great work. Um, but as always, the work of ERACI is there to catalyse uh, the work of others and to amplify those voices. And that's exactly what we are trying to do with this work. I'm just going to take you through a bit of a background to the issue uh, and then we'll talk about some of the findings and recommendations that ERACI presented in our report before we head into a discussion with our panel. Showing the light, the name of the report is adapted from a quote by one of the young parents interviewed during the, the research, a 23 year old care leaver. And we use this, this quote her quote is coming from such a horrible upbringing, my kids have been able to show me that light. We've adapted that quote. Because despite the trauma experienced in this young woman's life, with adequate supports, it came at the right time. Her children have brought her so much joy and she is trying to break that cycle. Let's have a look at the background. What do we know? What we know is that young people with experience of out-of-home care are one of the most vulnerable, disadvantaged and traumatised groups in Australia. We know that despite significant efforts by a range of agencies, 
the number of children and young people being removed into the system continues to rise. And at 30th of June 2020, there were around 46,000 children in out-of-home care across Australia. About one in 18 or 18,900 Indigenous children were in out-of-home care at the 30th of June 2020, and that represents about 11 times the rate of non-Indigenous children. We know that a substantial proportion of young people leaving care become parents under the age of 20 years. While rates of teenage pregnancy have been declining in the general population, rates for young parents with experience of out-of-home care and other vulnerable young people are disproportionately high and have remained stable over time. We know that the intergenerational nature of contact with the child protection system is profound. We know that young people with experience of the care system are more likely to parent young. Their children are more likely to enter the child protection system in turn, and they're more likely to experience repeat removal of more than one child. Having said that, the longitudinal data on young parents with care experience needs strengthening, and a lot needs to be done to address that issue alone. So we sought to answer some questions. One of those questions was, can we mitigate early parenthood among care leavers as a driver of further contact with the child protection system? And what supports are most effective for meeting the needs of young parents with care experience to prevent intergenerational contact? The project included research on two closely related cohorts, young parents and young people with care experience. For the purposes of this research, young parents are defined as people who became parents before the age of 20 years. Care experience is defined as having spent any amount of time in out-of-home care, which could be living in foster, relative or kinship care, family group homes, residential care or independent living. The research was inclusive of the experience and needs of young parent care leavers who also identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander those who are culturally and linguistically diverse, those who are living with disability, and those who are young fathers. The 12 month research project commenced in July, 2020 and com comprised several phases. Phase one involved the establishment of an expert reference group to guide the project and a rapid review of current literature to gather data to understand specific needs of young parents with experience of the care system and to identify interventions to support those needs. Phase two involved the stakeholder engagement component, which sought to consult with a broad range of researchers and experts, peak bodies, practitioners and services. In total, we interviewed 15 researchers and experts and 28 practitioners who are representing 15 organisations. We're very grateful to those people who spoke to us because those interviews uh, were instrumental in helping us identify and potentially recruit young parents to consult in phase three. We talked to a range of organisations who are providing services and support at the coalface. Programs specifically focused on young parents such as the Cradle to Kinder program in Victoria and the Young Parents program delivered by the Red Cross in New South Wales as well as alternative education programs like CC Cares at Canberra College in, here in the ACT, which supports young parents to finish school, and things like a trial program called the Supporting Expecting Parent Te uh, Teens, sorry, Supporting Expecting Parenting Teens, or SEPT, which is being delivered by the Brave Foundation and supports parents to connect to parenting support, life support, and educational opportunities in their local communities. And finally, phase three involved interviews with young parents with a care background. We were very fortunate to interview seven parenting care leavers during this phase. All were mums. Unfortunately, fathers were very difficult to get hold of. Um, all were mums and they'd become pregnant before the age of 20 and were now aged in their early to mid twenties. Most had completed schooling to a year 10 level Intergenerational contact with the care protection system through their own children was an issue for most of these families. I'd like to thank the young parents who participated in the project. Um, 
we deeply appreciate their, val their valuable contribution and willingness to share and discuss their personal and lived experiences. And I've got some of their voices here on the screen. These are the sorts of things we found when we spoke to young parents themselves. Parents told us that becoming a parent when they're young can result in a positive change in their life circumstances, an opportunity to, to start fresh, to make positive choices and to break that cycle. But we also found that young parents who've been involved with the care system experience a double stigma and a perception and reality of surveillance bias. We know that stigma and bias form additional barriers for young parents to access healthcare and support services, to remain in education, to find appropriate housing, and simply to engage in community life with their children. And for young Aboriginal parents with a care experience, we found a deep and pervasive experience of the intergenerational trauma of the stolen generation and other colonial practices harmful to First Nations people. As I mentioned earlier, although we refer to young parents, most of the literature goes into very little detail about the outcomes and needs of young fathers, and nor were we able to find any fathers to speak to in our research participants. What is known is that young fathers do often experience many of the same poor outcomes as young mothers, but that like young mothers becoming a parent can result in a positive change in their life circumstances. So what is the big issue here? What's the problem? A key issue is the explicitly child-centred approach that many services and practitioners work with. When a vulnerable young person has a baby, that baby frequently becomes the only child of interest to child protection authorities. The needs of the young parent who's also a child in need of protection can become overlooked as they're seen through a lens of potential risk to their child. They come under incredible scrutiny and if their child is taken into care, they'll often lose support services, which leaves them even more traumatised and vulnerable. Through our interviews, we heard about a child protection system that treats the young person as a risk to their child, a surveillance bias supplied where children are more likely to be reported for abuse or neglect because they're engaging with social services, so they perceive being under and may also experience greater scrutiny, and an overly high bar for success, all of which sets up the young parent to fail and perpetuates the cycle. And this represents a huge cost to society. And I know that some of our panel can speak to these costs later. In the report, we discuss putting the parent baby dyad and their needs at the centre, proactively supporting the young person to parent successfully, because that is in the best interest of both the young person and their child. And by doing so, we can break this cycle of inter intergenerational trauma building social capital and reducing significant welfare costs. The research identified a number of intervention points where appropriate supports could change the trajectory of both, for both parents and their children to either prevent early pregnancy or to support young care leavers to parent successfully. None of these are a silver bullet on their own, but together they offer opportunities to disrupt the intergenerational cycle of contact with the system. So the first opportunity to intervene is prior to pregnancy through targeted sex education and provision of contraception. And there's a couple of issues around this, notwithstanding that young people in care are more likely to engage in early sexual activity and may not be seeking to avoid parenthood. However, placement instability and lack of consistent education, engagement with education, sorry, mean that they are more likely to miss out on the usual avenues of sex, sex education. We also know that for some, their experiences and trauma can make them more vulnerable to sexual exploitation, particularly in a residential care setting or less able to assert themselves in relationships and set boundaries. So key are frequent, targeted and consistent sex education that addresses the potential desire to create a family, but gives realistic information about the difficulties and stresses of being a young parent. The second opportunity we identified is at pregnancy. 
ensuring that the right supports are put in place early and maintained throughout the pregnancy and the early years of parenting. Young people in, in care typically experience less consistent health care, including antenatal care. Explicit policies and, and processes are needed to address all the needs of the young parent to set them up to parent well and to reduce the risk of intergenerational contact with the system. Similarly, we know that effective through care and aftercare is critical to the life chances of young people who are leaving care. And this becomes even more important for young parents leaving care or those who become pregnant shortly after. Sustained practical support, such as income, housing, healthcare and education, social and emotional support and networks and ensuring life skills give a young person the best chances of parenting successfully. Extending the age of leaving care is one way of supporting young care leavers, parenting or otherwise, and we'll certainly talk about this with our panel. Other simple policy changes such as young parenthood automatically triggering the enhanced support on leaving care that is optionally available in all states and territories would be a good start to giving young parents with care experience the support and skills they need to parent well. Finally, the third opportunity to break the cycle is when a child is removed. This is a time when intensive support is needed rather than dropping away or being actively removed. For example, the loss of parenting payments at a time when they're particularly vulnerable, which may lead to homelessness, further reducing their ability for re reunification and increasing the risk of repeat pregnancy. This time is a prime opportunity to intervene with supports for the parents, ensuring supports and help for parenting increase and intensify rather than being withdrawn, which both aids in efforts at re reunification and reduces the likelihood of subsequent pregnancy and removal. <coughs> in our report, we applied the needs of young parents with care experience through the lens of a RACI's child and youth wellbeing framework, the NEST. Um, and just as an aside, this is an opportunity here to plug our recent publication, What's in the Nest, which unpacks the Nest framework and the ways it's being used in different settings. And for those who aren't familiar with the Nest, it came to life during a national summit where a young participant described all areas of wellbeing as forming a nest where, quote, if every area is supported, we're able to be happy and healthy and fly from the nest. It's certainly a way of thinking about the whole child or young person in the context of their daily lives, viewing well-being in a way that brings together the different elements they need in order to thrive. The NEST conceptualises well-being as six interconnected domains that support each other to help children and young people reach their potential. And in this context, to have optimal well-being, a young person needs to be adequately resourced in all six domains. Converse, conversely, neglecting a domain will have direct and indirect impacts on that young person's well-being and ability to parent successfully. I'm conscious of the time and I, I don't want to spend too long um, sitting with each of the domains, but I'll just quickly run through a couple of things that we touched on in our report and certainly there's a lot more detail in the report. In terms of being valued, loved and safe, for many people with care experience, we know that this is often far from the lived experience, that they don't have that feeling of being valued and loved and safe. Many are missing out on positive family environments and relationships and entering care, traumatised from their experiences of abuse and neglect. This fracturing of family and community connections is perpetuated by the out-of-home care system, which tends to exclude families and damage children's relationships further. As a result, they may lack parenting role models uh, and stability in their lives and their, the implications can be far reaching and lifelong. And you can see some of the needs that we've listed there by, by the valued, loved and safe domain. In terms of material basics, children and young people with material basics have the things they need. They live in secure, suitable, stable housing with appropriate clothing, nutritious food, clean water and clean air. They have access to transport, to required local services and to open spaces in nature and they, their family has enough money 
the necessities. Again, we know that children and young people in care often miss out on these material basics and this can become more acute once they leave care. Many care leavers struggle to meet their basic needs for food and shelter and, and suffer financial stress, which undermines their well-being. And for a particular, for a parenting care leaver, the added needs of the child may be difficult to meet. However, a young parent leaving care when supported with adequate financial support can overcome obstacles to be an effective parent. In terms of the healthy domain, we know that healthy children and young people have their physical, mental and emotional health needs met and all of their developmental health needs are provided for in a timely way. A barrier to accessing health services for many young pregnant and parenting women is a real or perceived lack of respect from medical professionals and a deep fear and mistrust of services. And this is a key issue amongst young parenting care leavers. Studies have also shown that young people exiting care have been found to experience significant health problems. And just quickly, in terms of learning, we'll touch on some of this later, but one of our key issues is the need for targeted sexual health education and support to remain engaged in schooling even when others come along. Participating is also a big one. Participating in decision making is a particular, particularly important area of wellbeing for young parents with care experience as they often have less agency over their lives and little participation in decision making about their own and their children's lives. Things like the commun commun <laughs> Cumulative effects of instability of placements, disengagement from school and losing friends can lead to decreased social supports for young parenting care leavers. And this combined with surveillance bias from services can lead to decreased access to health and family services, participating in community activities that support their own wellbeing and that of their children, including social and parenting groups and childcare. And the final nest domain is having a positive sense of identity and culture. This is central to the well-being of all children and young people. It's important for all, regardless of background, but in Australia, especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, young people in care are particularly vulnerable to a loss of identity and culture, and this can go on to contribute to poor outcomes during and post care. The impact for Indigenous and culturally and linguistically diverse young people can be even greater. For some young parents, this loss of identity can be a reason for their decision to become a parent. I'd like to now just hop on to talking about some of the recommendations that we present in the report. The National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children the uh, 2021 to 2031 uh, Safe and Supported Framework was launched last year and care leavers are a priority group in the framework. And in our report, we put forward a range of actions for this plan, 17 in total, that could be addressed in the short, medium and long term. I'd like to finish with the six actions that we feel could be addressed in the immediate or short term. And these are considered, these could be considered and made available without delay and we prioritise these as such. They're categorised according to their corresponding nest domain and where government responsibility for this rests, federal or state territory or both. Some of these rest on strengthened longitudinal tracking and data collection on young parents with experience in care, on intergenerational contact with the child protection system and on young parents under the care of the state. And as I said before, we know that data is a major issue with these cohorts and we've made the improvement of data systems a recommendation for the longer term. But in terms of these recommendations, the first one relates to the slide earlier on and that first opportunity to interrupt the cycle by preventing early parenthood with targeted education, ensuring that there's frequent tailored and targeted education about forming healthy relationships, safe sexual practices and the realities of parenting for all young people in care and their carers. Recommendation two relates to the issue of the need for a safety net for young parents in the immediate aftermath of child removal, such as the continuation of parenting payments for a period of at least six months post-removal 
to help ensure financial and housing security to aid family reunification processes. Recommendation three relates to the need to make automatic for young parenting care leavers the existing legal provision to extend support up to 25 years. We know that children and young people in care often miss out on material basics and this can become more acute once they leave care. Many care leavers struggle to meet their basic needs of food and shelter and financial stress, undermining their well-being. And for a parenting care leaver, the added needs of the child may be difficult to meet. However, we know that a young parent leaving care when supported with adequate financial support can overcome obstacles to be an effective parent. Recommendation four talks about the need for improved access to targeted and specialised mental health services tailored to young people in the care system as a protective factor to mitigate experiences of pre-care and ongoing, ongoing trauma. Recommendation five relates to participation in decision-making, a particularly important area of wellbeing for young parents with care experience. Increased opportunities for parenting care leavers to have their voice heard by those in government at both the state, territory and federal levels, as demonstrated by the Queensland Parenting Advisory Committee is something that we talk about in our report. This uh, committee, the QPAC as we call it, was established in 2019 and run by the Family Inclusion Network of South East Queensland in collaboration with the then Queensland Department of Child Safety, Youth and Women. It's best practice comprised of parents and family with lived experience of the child protection and family support system. And the idea being that they meet regularly with the Minister and Director General of the Department to help ensure the voices of parents and families in Queensland are being heard at the policy level. I'm really pleased that we have Shelley and Jessica here today who can speak to the importance of mentors and advocates to support young parents navigating different systems. Our final recommendation that could be actioned in the immediate or shorter term is the participation of care leavers and parenting care leavers in the design of programs that support them. A further longer term recommendation is that state and territory support strengthened opportunities for young parenting care leavers to stay in or re-engage with school through the delivery of flexible learning programs with on-site learning, on learning, early childhood education and care. We also recommend nationally consistent support for care leavers to access tertiary education opportunities. I'd like to finish there and jump into our discussion. But to finish, I'd just like to say that <clears throat> as a known population, these young people can be identified and targeted for support early, both to prevent early parenthood occurring and when it does, to help them parent successfully. The needs of young parents with care experience are multiple, requiring targeted and intensive support, but they're not complicated or surprising, nor are they expensive compared to the costs of intervening late or not at all. Thank you. So let me just pop my camera back on. And I will, oops, I'll just turn it off for the moment. Stop sharing my screen. Okay, put my camera back on. Mm -hmm. There we go. And now I'd like to, uh, to get our discussion started and encourage our panel members to join me by turning on their cameras and also unmuting themselves. <coughs> Got Philip there, Jessica, Shelley, and we should have Joseph there in a moment. There he is. Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce all of our panel members before we get started. Shelley Kevers is a Canberra based mum and a voice for those in the care system, having experienced the system herself. She's currently a youth ambassador for the Create Foundation and Anglicare, as well as an advocate for children and young people with a care experience. Shelley is undertaking a Bachelor of Social Work at the ACU here in Canberra. Hi, Shelley. Hi. Hi. Professor Philip Mendez is the Director of Social Inclusion and Social Policy Research 
unit in the Department of Social Work at Monash University in Melbourne. He's been researching the experiences of care leavers for more than 20 years and recently led a national study of Indigenous youth transitioning from care. Thanks for coming along, Philip. Hi, Barbara. Jessica Cox is a social worker and researcher with over 25 years experience in child and family practice and she currently leads service design and innovation at Life Without Barriers. In 2021, Jessica was the lead author of a report on peer parent advocacy service in child protection in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. And this parent and family peer advocacy service now continues under the auspices of the Family Inclusion Strategies in the Hunter, also known as FISH, which was an organisation led by parents with lived experience of child protection processes and it was also co-founded by Jessica. As a Churchill Fellow, Jessica has researched family inclusion in child welfare and her current research focuses parent peer advocacy and family inclusion. Thrilled to have you along, Jessica. Thanks and so last much for having us. Pleasure. Last but not least, we've got Dr. Joseph McDowell, who uh, comes to us from the flooded parts of South East Queensland. We hope that you're well, Joseph. Joseph joined the board of Create Foundation in 2008 and is now executive director of research there. He's written several reports for, for Create concerning transitioning from care in Australia. Recently, Joseph completed an analysis of the outcomes described by 325 young people with a care experience when striving to achieve independence. Joseph is currently an adjunct associate professor at University of Queensland and a visiting fellow at the Queensland University of Technology. Welcome to everyone and thanks a lot for coming and being with us today. I'm just gonna make your, my screen bigger. So in the time that we have available, which is just under an hour, we'd like to try and cover a few areas in relation to the topic that is kind of describing the problem um, and then turning to what Aracy learned about the how and when we might intervene and then looking at opportunities to, um, and then looking at opportunities in the current policy landscape. And then we'll tackle some questions from our, from our audience. And I can see that we've got over 180 participants today um, here with us and we had a lot more that signed up and registered for the webinar. So that is absolutely terrific and speaks volumes about um, the importance of this issue to a lot of people in, in, uh, out there. To begin the discussion, I'd like to spend some time describing that problem that I talked about in my slides. Um, and that is that a key issue frequently mentioned to us was the treatment of a young parent as a risk to their own child. Um, we've, we heard over and over again that when a young, vulnerable young person has a baby, that that baby becomes the only child of interest. Um, to protection authorities and that that child-centred approach turns away from that young person and focuses just on their baby. We heard a lot about surveillance bias and that high bar for success, that bar that's not at all applied to other young people who might be having a child who haven't experienced the care system. Um, what I wanted to do was start by talking about how the system would ideally uh, view the young parent and their child as, as a dyad, as that one, proactively supporting that young person to parent successfully because that would be in the best interests of, of them, of the young person and their child. So I'd like to start by turning the question to all of you um, and asking what are your views on this issue and whether this resonates with you? What have you sort of seen? What have you heard? What have you experienced? Um, Shelley, as our as our young voice on the panel and our young care leaver, I'd love for you to speak first, but I know that that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you might feel pressure there. Um, without putting you that pressure on you, is there anything that you'd like to start by saying? Um, and if not, we can come back to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. Sure. I think, um, yeah, I've definitely heard a lot about the surveillancing. I've, you know, in my professional kind of realm, I've personally witnessed um, young care leavers have their children removed, but with no evidence risk. It was just purely because they were a care leaver um, or they were still under care orders. And I found that extremely alarming, um, especially when I found myself pregnant with my daughter. I thought, oh my gosh, like, is this gonna be something I'm gonna be subjected to, but yet I have no risk factors. 
I had never been, you know, in the justice system ever. Um, and it was kind of brought to my attention by some of my colleagues having, you know, worked in community services for 12 years now, you know, saying to me, maybe prepare yourself for this potential. Um, and then just having to go through the process of having to get like, you know, legal advice should this happen to me. And I just thought this should not even be a consideration. This is horrible. And then to think that this is happening to, um, you know, young people that were a lot younger than me um, at the age I did fall pregnant, I just thought of how horrible it was to, you know, go through a really traumatic experience of the care system itself and then yet again be knocked down yet again. Um, I just thought, wow, I thought, yeah, this question really resonated with me. And then professionally thinking that highlighted even more issues with the system um, and that's what provoked me to get into social work and community services is acknowledging there's so many systemic problems. But, you know, years later after I had left care as an adult, these problems were still here and there can be so many policies around, you know, wanting to do the world of good, but yet there's still the underlying problems. Thanks so much, Shelley, and I appreciate you sharing your lived experience with us. A lot of the, a lot of us in the, around the panel were nodding our heads. I'd like to turn to Jessica now. Jess, the work that you've done, you've come across a lot of young women, uh, families experiencing some of this stuff. What have you, <coughs> what have you seen in your work? Yeah, this, um, the way you've described this problem really resonates with me and my experience and the many parents and families and children that I've worked with over the years. And I think um, we often talk about the system being child focused. In terms of the um, out of home care and child protection system, I would argue that it, it has that intent, but ultimately I think it's, um, as you've so well described, um, Shelley and Barbara, it's surveillance focused and it's also very placement focused. So once a child is removed from their parents, the, the spotlight, if you like, so it's an amplet, really well-named <laughs> report in that sense. The spotlight is shifted to um, the child in their out-of-home care placement along with all the resources. So I think the numbers speak for themselves when we know that we spend 60% of the budget in child protection out-of-home care goes into placements, goes into out-of-home care placements and not to helping families. Um, Look, there's so much to respond to and I don't want to take up too much airtime. But the other thing that I'd say as a social worker is that the evidence is totally in support of a child and parent family focus. It is not child focused to be child focused almost. <laughs> it is child focused to be child and family focused. And children, um, the, the children's rights discourse is often used as an argument to um, to focus only on children to the exclusion of parents. But the UN Convention doesn't say that. The UN Convention says very clearly that children have a right for their parents to be supported and help to be the best they can be. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess, the key things that stand out for me. Excellent, Jess, thank you. And lots of issues there. Philip, would you like to speak about your work in this area and what you've come across as well? And then we'll turn to, to Joseph. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Look, I think it's worth reflecting on the role of the corporate parent and the fact that the responsible minister in any jurisdiction is, is both the parent of the young care leaver parent, but also becomes the grandparent of their child. And as the corporate parent, they've got a responsibility to support the well-being of both. So that means making the same normative commitment as any other parent in the general community would make to providing ongoing nurturing and financial, social and emotional support for their children and indeed their grandchildren in order to maximise their ambitions and achievements. So, Take into account what the Eraser report has reported about evidence of surveillance bias. We're particularly aware through our recent National Indigenous Leaving Care Study 
that there are very high rates of early pregnancy for uh, Indigenous care leavers and that is connected to inter intergenerational trauma and many of them do end up having their children removed. So I, I think to sum it up, at the very least, there, there must be a worker or slash a responsible adult looking after the material and relation relationship support needs of any young parent leaving care till at least 25, as you've argued in the report. And, yeah. and if there are gen genuine concerns for the safety of their child, um, they arguably need to be addressed by a different worker and process. Um, so there needs to be advocates for both the parent and the child, if that makes sense. Excellent point, yeah, fantastic. Joseph, would you like to comment on anything there? Well, yes, I, I'd like to say that I think this is a fantastic report. I think really if the recommendations that are made here were implemented, many of the, the difficulties, the challenges that young people are transitioning from the care system, parents and non-parents, the difficulties would be removed completely. I think the certainly the issue of the, the dyadic model I think is a really important one because you you can't just focus on one child in this combination because both are obviously still relevant. And I, I see the this situation as almost a subset of what happens in the community when children are removed from parents because they're there should be support for those parents. Our main focus is on reunification to try to get the children back with parents. But we do very little about improving parent capacity. And I think that is fundamental. And for this particular group, the young parents, uh, it's even more important that we really, because there we've got a chance to actually help them, support them at that really critical stage so that they can pick up their skills and, and be competent to be parents. So I, I think the, the surveillance aspect obviously is something we've been concerned about for a long time. It's um, you know, obvious, you, you, and particularly for Indigenous young people, because they're, they're watched like hawks in these situations. And if anything sort of looks uh, problematic, the first response is to take away the, the children. Whereas really, now we know with our new national framework that first priority group is children and families that are suffering disadvantage. So there's there's an opportunity for us to really work with these young people and give them as much support as we possibly can before children are removed. Absolutely, and I'd like to talk about the framework in a moment. Was there any other comments there before? We move on to another question. I'll, I'll just jump in quickly and just say that um, something stood out for me in terms of the, describing the problem is that we really need to reframe young parents as the solution for their children. We often talk about, and your report talks about how the parents are framed as risky um, and they're surveilled and assessed looking for risk rather than looking for potential and capability. And I think that's a real, there are real opportunities for um, us to change really quite simple things we can do in terms of language um, that, uh, just to name one example, to really shift the way that we think about um, Uh, child safety uh, and the potential and capability of young parents rather than the risks that they present. Hmm. No, I think that that's so true. And and I think the report mentions, and we hear over and over again, that a lot of the, the young parents see this as a great opportunity. They are really excited about becoming parents. And with a little bit of help, um, they, they would be incredibly successful. So, I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity for us as a community to support them 
to make sure that, that their outcomes are uh, as wonderful and, and as excellent as they can be. Thanks, Joseph. Um, we looked at the most effective supports for meeting the needs of young parents. Um, and I talked about that intergenerational cycle and some of the points, the opportunity points at which we could, I don't like the word intervene, but op opportunities where we could um, disrupt the cycle. And I think I made the point that it's not a silver bullet, but that but that there are some opportunities there that together they might be able to present something that could work. Um, we talked about the prevention of, of pregnancy to start with, so appropriate sort of levels of sex ed and that sort of thing. Um, we talked about on becoming pregnant and on leaving care and the holistic support um, commencing at pregnancy and continuing through uh, to prevent child protection interaction. And then, of course, there's the option of when a child's removed, the intensive support to help prevent repeat removals. And there's so much going on there in that cycle. Um, I'm wondering whether you'd all like to speak to your thoughts about those intervention points, um, whether it's the, the points at the, 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 the front end or if it's during the middle or the cycle of the cycle or at the end there. What resonates for you given your experience um, and work in the space? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I might I think respond it, I think all first if people don't. Oh, sorry, oh. Justin. <laughs> sorry. I, I, I mean, I think we all agree that prevention is better than cure. So uh, the first step that, that you're advocating uh, to improve uh, sexual education is, uh, is really a no-brainer. It's just something that, that really has to happen. But I think I think you did raise other interesting points too because quite often sex education is about improving knowledge and letting people understand what they need to do to stay safe sexually. But, but here we've got a very special group because some actually want to become parents. So that talking about the difficulties and, and the challenges that that might actually generate for them in their future lives, when there's a lot of that type of work that's going to have to be done in that educational program as well. Uh, so it's not just a matter of the, the traditional sex education. I think the second where they need support, well, that's what the young people told us in our study. Um, I think it was 42% said that they need childcare because we've now got groups, uh, they're becoming more active, involved in further education, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, a lot of them were working part-time uh, so that's good. That's taking the burden off the community. But in doing that, if they've got children, they're going to need some support. And the child care you mentioned in the report about setting up creches and um, making sure they've got access to creches and child care. And I think that that's really very important to allow these young people to have the opportunities that, that they, they want to take. I suppose I, well, I should shut up. <laughs> I just just make the point that uh, for the third one, um, certainly after the, the children are removed, uh, certainly they need parenting capacity training so that they build up their skills. But a lot of the 15%, I think it was, of our young group uh, told us that one of the great difficulties they have is actually having some contact with their children who've been taken into care that that becomes a real problem. And that then relates to their mental health as well. So. Excellent, thank you. No, Joseph, that's wonderful because you do have that experience from your own studies with CREATE, which are very powerful and very important um, for discussion here. Did anyone else well, want to speak to points on the intervention cycle, if you like? I. I'd like to comment particularly on part one, Barbara, and actually quite a little bit from the PhD work of Jade Patel at Monash University, because I think a lot of people in the general community think let's just apply teenage pregnancy prevention programs and that will sort out the problem. And, and what Jade's research has shown is that a lot of the young people um, leaving care that have children, 
um, uh, will not be effectively targeted by those programs because they choose to have children and they choose mm -hmm. to have uh, children for a number of complex reasons. And one of them is that many have experienced enormous grief and loss both entering the child, um, the state care system at being separated from their family, then often experiencing placement stability in the system, which has meant being cut off from existing connections with family or community or friends. And that then can have an adverse ongoing impact on their ability to form attachments and positive relationships. So many, many choose to have children because they want to create a new family to love them, as you've said in the report title, showing the light. So that is a really, really important motivation. Briefly on part two, there's no doubt that we need to provide holistic support to young parents who've left care in areas such as housing, carers, mentors and role models during and after pregnancy. And there's actually a lot of evidence from the UK and other jurisdictions about effective um, supports in those areas. But one particular form of support that I think really needs to be applied in Australia is peer support work models where care leavers who've had children, who, who are um, comfortable in that role can provide ongoing support and advice to, to new young parents. That is something that really needs to be trialled. And thirdly, I, I certainly agree with Joseph that we've got to provide ongoing continuing care um, to all care leaders, particularly young parents, so they can optimise their parenting skills and optimise access to support resources, which again is something we would do for any other young parents in the general community. Indeed, excellent points, Philip. And I'd like to call out the work, the work of, um, give a shout out to Jade, Jade Patel's work. Um, and she, she really gave us a lot of great um, support in our early research on this piece. Could you talk a little bit more about that model from overseas around the peer support for those who have, you know, have a lived experience um, sharing their support with those who are new to the to the space of having a child? Well, I think it, it, it's something that the peer support work model has been very extensively developed in mental health and alcohol and drugs in, in Australia and beyond. But there hasn't been a big application yet to out of home care. But what we are certainly finding in some early research we're doing at Monash University is that there is enormous potential for that model to be applied. And the fact that um, young people can come in who've had lived experience of uh, being in care and leaving care and particularly of being young parents and, and living that journey, that can be enormously effective in supporting young parents because these are people they can relate to. They, they can see that they've had similar experiences in care or leaving care and they've got through that and, and it's worked out for them. So often young, young care leavers and young parents particularly are more willing to listen to and learn from peer advocates. But also extending that, I think the, the whole, I think you've mentioned about the personal advisor model in the UK. I mean, to have someone who you can touch base with, who's there on a continuing basis to support you. Um, it, it, peer, the peer support is excellent because you've got people who understand the situation, but even having somebody else uh, who's there to help you, whatever the, the issue, uh, I think is, is something, we, we've been advocating for that for years and I, why we don't, I mean, Philip did a wonderful study, Berry Street showing how important it is and why we can't get that rolled out generally, I, I don't know, but that, that would help as well. Thanks, Joseph. Any thoughts there, Jess or, or Shelley, around the idea of peer support, peer advocates in this space? 
Um, I think some of the work I've done with CREATE, um, being able to mentor people that were still in the care system and some of them are young parents, um, like it's been really fulfilling and really empowering for me, but also for them because um, I've, you know, walked a really similar journey. I think a lot of people sort of ask me too, like what got me through my care experience, like what specifically, like sort of thinking with a professional lens of interventions. And I said it wasn't like an intervention. It was someone that got me through it, someone that advocated for me and stood up and said when things went right and, you know, got me the things and the support that I needed. So I think that's what really turned my care experience into a positive one at the end, whereas before that um, I had no one speaking up for me and the experience was horrible. So I think something like this would be amazing. Oh, yeah, I love look, that. I'd really... The idea of sorry, someone sorry. rather than an intervention. That's... Um, thank you, yeah. Shelley. That's really powerful. Sorry, Jess, go on. No, I was going to say exactly the same thing. Um, and I think that is the beauty of, um, of peer advocacy. And I would really use the term advocacy to encompass things like support and mentoring, um, because I, I would really argue that advocacy is a really, really important part of that peer support, because this system is so um, power laden and the power imbalances are just so stark. Um, so a clear role for advocacy to really try and level that playing field is really important. And the other, the other thing that, um, I'd, I'd like to just really applaud your, let's really reinforce your finding around um, number three to prevent recurrent removals. Um, I think if we can really rethink the idea of prevention and bring it up to that point of working and supporting families who have had children removed is just crucial. There's the, it's the removal of those kids and their lack of support given to um, to young parents who are struggling to hold on to a parent identity um, that is driving these high numbers of kids in care. So if we can really reframe our thinking about prevention and bring it further down the spectrum to work with families who have experienced removal, I just think that's just an obvious policy lever that we need to pull. And um, just one, if I could just make one last point about advocacy is that not only, and certainly this is my experience in our trial in the Hunter Valley, um, not only does peer advocacy um, help the parents that it's working with, but it, it impacts the system more broadly because it role models to all of us practitioners and researchers and policy makers that parent, young parents are the solution here. They can be leaders, they are change agents, and they can work as service providers and really disrupt the system. Any further comments from the panel before we move on? Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the national framework has been released last year and care leavers are a priority group. Um, we put forward some recommendations, 17 in total, and some of them could be seen as something that could be done sooner rather than later. And I, I, I walked you through those just to remind you there were things like um, uh, the safety net for parents in the aftermath of child removal, the legal provision to extend support for young parenting care leavers up to 25, um, improved access to mental health um, services. And some of these are federal government responsibilities and some of them fall to the jurisdictions. That aside, or if perhaps those other things you'd like to talk about, how I mean, how would you like to see policy respond to this issue? It's a it's a big question, and I guess, and and I'd also like to talk about our hopes or, or your concerns for the national um, framework itself. Um, would anyone like to go first around policy responding to this issue? I'm I'm happy to begin if nobody else wants to jump in. I guess I've been researching this area for over 20 years and to say that it's time to act nationally is an absolute understatement. We in Australia are a laggard. We are lagging way behind the UK. We are lagging way behind the USA where we often sort of 
um, you know, poke them as being a bit underdeveloped in social policy, but we're well behind them. New Zealand have now legislated uh, to support all care leavers till 21 years to fund carers. Uh, so we need to catch up. We've made some very good progress in extending care in about five or six of the eight states and territories as a result of the fabulous home stretch campaign. But it's important to note that there's a lot more to be done. So at the moment, only two of the eight states and territories uh, support all care leavers till 21. Uh, only Victoria and Western Australia provide funding for resi care leavers at the moment. The other six don't. And none of the eight states or territories at the moment enable uh, young people leaving resi care to stay in their existing placement once they turn 18, nor have they trialled what is called staying put in England, where uh, young people leaving resi care are, are, are found housing quite near their placement, which enables them to maintain existing support relationships with workers or young people that they had been living with. So there's a lot to be done there. Now, how do we progress? The, the national framework is the obvious way to progress. It's the obvious way to get a nationally consistent universal model of extended care, which is what we need uh, absolutely unconditionally, that would support all care leavers, doesn't matter whether they're leaving foster care or kinship care or residential care or permanent care, we must be supporting them well beyond 18 years of age so that there is a minimum requirement benchmarked for all jurisdictions. And that is something the national framework should do and, and can do. It's not only to ensure we've got a consistent model for all jurisdictions, but it's also a matter of supporting um, the entitlements of mobile care leavers, because we know that a lot of young people, particularly Indigenous young people that want to find a way back to their family or their country will leave from one state to another or they'll go from Brisbane to Cairns, they will move around. So we need a nationally consistent model that, that will support everybody. And, and the arguments are overwhelming. They're not only social arguments, they're economic arguments. And the economic costs of not supporting these young people to at least 21, if not 25, have been demonstrated by Deloitte in a number of reports and a number of other studies. So the arguments are overwhelming and the national framework uh, needs to act tomorrow, not the next day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, but Philip. Hear, I, I, hear. <laughs> I think uh, to have a national, I mean, that was why we had the first a national framework and the, the national standards for um, out of home care to try to get that consistency and some general agreement. I think we've got a great opportunity now with the new framework, although we have to be careful because. In one way, it's, it's better because now they've separated out the Indigenous group. They will have their own set of action plans um, compared with non-Indigenous. Now, that just means that we're going to have to make sure that all of the proposals we put forward are included in both sets of plans uh, because it's, it's relevant to everybody in the care system. So I think that, that's important. And I think the other thing that really worries me and I'm on the group that's sort of liaising with DSS to come up with the action plans. And apparently there'll be some release in March of a few highlights, but most of it's going to be finished around May and June. Uh, so, but the thing that, that isn't clear yet is are we going to preserve the national standards? Are we going to review what we had, keep what was really good and, and maybe enhance the standards uh, in, in certain areas in terms of, because we always wanted support to 25 as a standard, but it wasn't included. So there are ones that we could improve in terms of the standards, but if we don't have the standards, we've really got nothing to measure against, to see, are we giving the support to the young people that, that they're entitled to? Uh, 
uh, or, or you know, is the system working the way it's supposed to? So I, I think they're issues for me that are incredibly important, that we do make sure that we've got coverage across all of the plans that are being developed. We don't do this sort of fragment and then make it difficult and have things falling through the cracks and that we do preserve the standards. Thanks, Joseph. Jess, did you want to make any comments about um, how you'd see policy respond to the issues? Sure, yep. No, I have a list as well. Um, I'd endorse what Philip and Joseph said, but I'd also just really encourage us to think um, realistically about who young people are. And not, not everybody ages out of care at 18, either permanent care or otherwise, and that we really need to be inclusive of um, children, young people who might leave the care system before the age of 18, especially young people who go home. And if we're really gonna try and um, increase, reunification is crucial to um, achieve the National Framework's goals. It's crucial for young parents um, and we need to, but it's not a, it's not always a happy ending. Like it's not always an easy, um, uh, an easy process. And those those kids need support as well, even though they might leave care when they're, I don't know, in primary school or whatever. Um, I, in terms of a policy lever, I would just really um, endorse the earlier comments about peer support and advocacy it needs to be embedded across the system, it needs to happen at a casework level, at a program level, at a policy level, which is a really drive those voices of lived experience. So Joseph, when you're at that meeting, whenever it is in the next week or so, just really um, let's ask ourselves, are young parents at that table? Are they involved in those workshops in a meaningful and ongoing way? Um, I would really, I think we need to get um, our colleagues in the legal profession and I'm really excited to see the recommendations about legal representation and advocacy um, in the report. I think they are absolutely part of the solution here um, to challenge power imbalances and really hold the system to account. We need more lawyers involved across the spectrum, early intervention, care, reunification, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd love to, I'll, I'll shut up soon, but I would love to see a guaranteed basic income, not just for young parents, but for all care leavers trialed in Australia as soon as mm. possible. That's happening elsewhere in the world. It is such, it is such an important thing to trial. And I, I would suggest that it will reap real benefits for this whole cohort. Yeah. So that's just three, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. And I, I imagine Shelley has some thoughts on that 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 last recommendation of yours. Shelley, is there anything you'd like to add to to that discussion? Um, I think for me, um, we can have so many people that are on board and they want to implement change, and we'll have the policies to do that. I think putting that into practice seems to be like a really common problem, um, and running into the same obstacles and roadblocks, so to say, with local and federal government. I've certainly wasted, it seems like, many breaths trying to repeat myself with the same systemic problems to the same people, you know, on a quarterly basis, on and on and on for like the past 10 years at least. So I'm ultimately concerned that we're going to run into the same obstacles, but I think there's still so much other work that can be done and should be done and should have been done, you know, yesterday. Yeah, look, can I, and I think there's a real danger, like I think this, this work gets politicised because of the state and federal territory stuff and we get all moral about it. Um, we've got to really try and get that. I mean, I know that everything is political to some extent, but we really need to get that focus on children, young people, young parents, and Get the politics out as much as we can. Here, mm here. -hmm. Yeah, there needs to be more transparency. I think that's something that young people say a lot is their Absolutely. interactions with mm -hmm. organisations. They just seem to be talking to a, a deaf wall, so to say. I'd like to. Thanks for that. I'd like to turn to. Um, uh, some questions now from participants and we've got a few here we've got comments and questions and so I'm just going to do this as 
uh, I go down the list. Easy question that's come through, what was the location of your study? Uh, so this was a national study. It also looked at uh, work from overseas. Um, but in terms of people we spoke to, it was mainly from experts and researchers and uh, pr practitioners around um, Australia, as well as um, young parents across Australia as well. Next question, what options does a parent have to argue to not have their child removed? Um, is there someone on the panel who <laughs> would like to answer that? I'm not sure what, what options. I mean, probably very few given the status of the young people. I mean, if you've got lots of resources and you can hire legal representation, I'm sure you could uh, ask questions, but how many of our cohort would ever be able to do that is uh, very unlikely. I can just sort of give a piece of advice that parents have told us in Newcastle, which is to, and it, it's it's not necessarily straightforward, and Shelley may, you will almost certainly have um, ideas as well, is to get an advocate, to get support and, and, and an advocate as soon as possible. Um, and also, if you're interested in finding out more about what parents have learned um, and applied in their dealings with different departments, um, you can go to the FISH website and there's a bunch of resources around how to navigate the system. Um, and perhaps a RACI would put the FISH website on the chat or something. I, yeah, but there are heaps of resources on that website to give advice to parents. It's not just in for my, young parents. Though. In my experience, depending on the department, they'll have their frameworks and their guidelines available for you to look as well. I might just throw in here, Barbara, from a point of view of thinking about long-term systemic change, particularly for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents, my, my argument would be that we need to duplicate what happens in North America, where mostly decisions about child protection and removal of children are made by um, Indigenous organisations. So, um, they are made with an awareness of cultural identity and connection and um, an application of culturally responsive practice so that we don't have the situation we have here where enormous numbers of Aboriginal children are still removed and often placed with um, uh, non-Aboriginal carers. That's an excellent point, Philip. And I'd just like to read something that someone has sent in. I have an ex-foster child who has just been through this. As a young Indigenous care leaver, she's been put under horrendous scrutiny and pressure by the child protection system. She's a great young mum. She escaped family violence and the system blamed her. Risky. Absolutely. Yeah. It always seems to... Sorry. No, yeah. go on, go on. Someone else has written in here, I'm not sure if it's a question, it's quite long. It always seems to me that early identification and intervention have the best benefits for infants, children, parents and families. Was there any financial cost analysis done around doing this, uh, how, how that would cost, rather than the massive and traumatising and heavy interventions and costs that occur in maintaining child protection systems and children in out-of-home care if things head in a, a difficult direction? Um, yeah, it's a great question. We didn't do any cost benefit work in this study, but I know that there's been some work done. Was it the parliamentary inquiry in Victoria? Philip, you might have some thoughts around costs for children in care, something around the one hundred to three hundred thousand dollar mark per year. Isabel. <laughs> Look, there are annual figures from the Productivity Commission report on mm. government services, which indicates the cost of, I think, either foster care or kinship care or residential care. And from memory, it, it was, I think, about fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year for a child in foster care, but about three times that for residential care. The interesting thing with those figures, while it tallies up to a huge 
amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars. The amount of spending once a young person uh, turns 18 and leaves care from then till 21, let alone beyond 21, is so tiny comparatively. Um, it's not funny. So that, that has been an overwhelming argument that um, all that money is spent and then that investment suddenly stops. It's a bit like playing three quarters of a football grand final and not playing the last quarter. Um, so, and, and there is an associated argument, you're quite right, um, and I think you made the point earlier, or it might have been Jessica, about how so much of that child protection spending goes on child protection workers and out of home care, uh, but very little on early intervention or family support. Um, and clearly it's been shown that a much bigger spending in that area um, would probably recruit far bigger savings overall. Yeah, it would. It would save a fortune if we could reduce the number of children in care and if we looked after them properly when they left care. It would, because it's not just expenditure in the child protection system that um, that we're talking about here. If we can do a better job um, with uh, these young people, then we'll reduce expenditure in future systems as well, cool. health and et cetera. Now, way back, I think it was Philip would correct me, 2006, I think it was, that Morgan Disney did a huge report that looked at pathways through care and the cost of all of those. So, and that's probably might be out of date in terms of the amounts a little bit, but um, it certainly shows the general cost if we don't do anything to help young people early on. But if I could also just add, like it, the cost issue was really important and I think there would be lots of cost savings, but we shouldn't do this because it, in order to save money, we should do this because it's the right thing to do. Um, and because people, I guess children, young people and their families have a right to it. I think the cost, the cost has been done to try to convince the politicians that, hey, this, is, this would be a very sensible thing to do economically. But they're not interested because they're on three or four year electoral cycles and um, this is a life course event, you know, 40, 50 years uh, where the savings are going to occur. So cost does not really convince our elected representatives, unfortunately. Yeah. I've, this is something I've spoken to multiple representatives about and the answer I get is, well, we've, we've already spent X amount on child protective services and out of home care and that's all I really get. <laughs> that's all the response I really get. It's pretty shameful. Yeah. Shameful is a good word for it. Um, we've heard from Daryl Higgins. Some of you might know Daryl. He's from the Institute of Child Protection Studies at uh, ACU. Um, and he's saying, and he might be responding about something particular that I said. So he says, I think that's part of the problem. I'm not sure what he's referring to there. But he goes on that there are so many, there are so few, sorry, resources and supports for young parents in the general community and no public health approach to delivery of non-stigmatising parenting supports. So anything delivered for this population isn't working off the back of an existing well-developed prevention net. He goes on to ask, can you comment on whether or how better supports for care leavers who are young parents could be embedded into more broadly available supports and where such supports could be offered, delivered or embedded? Question. Is there anyone who'd like to have a go at answering that? Well, I'm not, not sure about answering it, but I think when you looked at your model that you put forward, uh, really it showed that the, a lot of the issues relate to all care leavers. Um, so if we can provide services that are going to support everybody, but then really make sure that the young parents who have those particular needs uh, get access and are helped to get access, uh, that, that will help tremendously. But I think uh, I think the point is that um, what we've talked about um, improving parenting capacity. Well, that's across the board. All parents who have children removed should have that support. Uh, and the young people, 
even more so because it's probably more likely to help them because they haven't sort of entrenched bad practices. They're, they're just finding their way. So they will benefit the most compared with, say, people who have other issues that make it hard to develop extra skills. But to have that sort of model working for everybody would be fantastic. Mm. Um, I'll just make, I think this, the issue of stigma is really, really important. And the report talks about the double stigma of young parents who with a care experience. And I think that's really, and the stigma of having a child removed too and having interaction with the child protection system is huge. Like it's really, and I think mm. um, having more peers involved, more people with lived experience in the sector really challenges that stigma. We've certainly found that in the Hunter Valley when parents have come forward and talked about their experiences and been presented not as problems and difficulties and, and stigmatised people, but as solutions, people with strengths and leadership and agency. So that's one thing to address stigma. And the other comment I'd make about Daryl's very insightful remarks are that we really need to embed these services throughout the community in localised ways and in ways that where young parents have as much control as possible over what those services look like, where they can shape them for themselves rather than have us, perhaps not so experts, decide mm. that for them. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, Okay, I have a final question and I'm also conscious of the time. So we're gonna wind up in a moment and perhaps to answer this final question. Um, as a worker in the intensive family support program, often supporting young new parents who've left care, could you make, could you provide some examples of how we might be able to make sure we're focusing on the dyad instead of just that child or baby? Anyone want to grab that? I'm really keen to hear from Shelley if I don't want to put her on the spot, but. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess I'd think of it as the family as a unit and, you know, the obstacles are, are broad and vast across the family unit and everyone's family unit is different, um, especially if you've come from a care background your network's going to be different or you might not even have a support network. So I think supporting everyone to learn, you know, essentially how to parent, especially if the parental figures during a young care leaver's care experience haven't necessarily been positive parental figures, just showing them way. Because um, I haven't, I'm yet to meet a young care leaver that's also a parent that didn't want to learn. It's just they didn't quite know the way so I think, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, helping everyone and working together and not against one another. And I think that's when participation is just so important. I, th I think it comes back to training of the caseworkers, really. It's that's in, in they've, they've got to understand when they're looking at the situation that we're not just focusing on the, the baby or the, the really young uh, child, but it is a unit. As um, as we've said that, um, and I think that's beautiful. The dyad uh, is just yeah, it sort of gives it a, a wholeness that those two are sort of inextricably entwined, and their issues are comparable. So I think the, the workers just need to understand that, and we've talked about trauma informed uh, training and and all of that. But this would be another aspect that would have to be really focused on, brought to their attention so that they're aware that this is something they need to look at. And I'd really encourage workers to ask themselves a question um, every day, which is, am I helping a parent, the parent work towards goals that they have set for themselves? I think that's a terrific note um, to finish with, with that question particularly. But I think we will wrap it up here. And I'd like to thank you all so much for your contribution to this discussion. And it will go on. It will continue, of course, and it, it will 
be picked up hopefully the report but also I hope that it amplifies the voices and the work that you've been doing in this space for some time as well each and every one of you. Um, before we close would anyone like to make any final comments on the report or on your work or on the issue itself? I, I think Barbara briefly just would really emphasise as we start thinking about new possibilities around extended care, around supporting young parents, particularly that um, governments and authorities building independent evaluations so that the eff effectiveness of new programs is tested and is accountable not only to ministers, but to parliaments and a whole range of stakeholders in the community. Thanks, Philip. Thanks for your support as well. Anyone else? I, nothing really to add, but I think that point of Philip's is so important. We've got to get it out of politics. It shouldn't be a party issue. Um, I think parliament is really the, the parent and should be looking after our children. So the more we can start to move to that end, I think the better we'll be. Thanks, Joseph. Jess? Oh, look, I've probably had my last word, but I think, the, um, I think we just need to continue to work really hard to reframe parents and family as the solution to child abuse and neglect and child, and child harm in general in the community. Parents and family are the solution, change agents and the leaders that we need to follow. Thank you, he here. Shelley, I'd like to give you the final opportunity to speak before we finish up. Um, thanks for that. I think I want everyone to take away a lot from this, but also thinking, you know, how things are and how systemic operations are right now. Is there any benefit to not making changes? Thank you. Well, thank you to all of you and to our audience for contributing today. And we'll now bring the event to a close, which is a shame really, I could talk for a lot longer. Um, please read the report and if you don't feel like reading the report, we've also for the very first time produced a very small, small video which will make its way online at some point. Um, so you can look at that as well. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. So I will sign off here and say thank you again. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.